Welcome. I'm Janine Jackson. I am the program director at FAIR, the Media Watch Group, and I also host and produce Counterspin, FAIR's radio show. We are, in a moment, I'm going to in introduce the illustrious panel. We are here to talk about diversity of all sorts in new and emerging media, how to make the ongoing transition of the forms and formats of news a chance to do something more than just reproduce the news values of existing media, but to show how we can produce news that, that really reflects those values to which traditional journalism speaks fealty, independence, fairness, accuracy, but to also place centrally the value of diversity and inclusivity that the currently dominant media have shown they do not place centrally. What's the first thing to go when money is tight, which for media corporations means it's not actually falling from the sky? Uh, well, it's those affirmative action training programs. You know, it makes it very clear that for these outlets, diversity is a good thing, but it's really a kind of noblesse oblige. You know, you can take it back if it's, if it's not working for you. It's a, it's a kind of static good thing that you tack on after you've made uh, your good journalism. And that's not enough for us. So our panelists don't so much think about these questions as live them, uh, as well as think about them. So I'm gonna introduce them now and we will get going. Latrell Crittenden is co-founder and editor of The Voice of Philadelphia, which is an independent nonprofit news and education site founded in 2010 that seeks to give voice to historically underrepresented populations. He is also a visiting professor in the Center for Communications Excellence at Lincoln University. Uh, to his right is Jacqueline Friedman. She's an artist, an activist, a, I meant to say activist, I'm sure you're an artist too as well, writer and performer. She edited the book, Yes Means Yes, Visions of Female Sexual Power and a World Without Rape. And she is a founder and the executive director of Women, Action, and the Media, a national organization working for gender justice in media, which put on a terrific conference when they can, you should all be aware of. She writes a weekly column on sexuality and sexual violence for Amplify Your Voice. That's a site devoted to promoting healthy sexuality for young people. Chris Rabb, to her right, am I saying your name properly? Thank you is a fellow at Demos, the public policy research and advocacy organization. He's also a visiting researcher at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Chris, way back in 1999, founded AfroNetizen. That's the news aggregator focused on issues of concern to African Americans. And that was one of the small inaugural group of bloggers that received press credentials to cover the 2004 Democratic National Convention here in Boston. Uh, he does many other things as well. And is that book, yeah, Invisible Capital, is that out? No, it's out and in his hand. <laughs> he is author of Invisible Capital, How Unseen Forces Shape Entrepreneurial Opportunity. <laughs> Um, yeah, I need that check. And at the end of the table is Flo Hernandez Ramos, who is host of Cancion Mexicana, a music and information program on Cuvo, do you say Cuvo? In Colorado, and a founding organizer of that station, on the air now 26 years, which is no mean feat. She also works with the Latino Public Radio Consortium. All right, then that is our panel. I'm going to assume the technical people will tell me if there are technical problems. I'm sort of hearing two of me, but as long as it's okay to you, that's fine. A little bit about the format. We're going to have a conversation up here for a while, and then getting along to 3 o'clock or maybe just before, we will open for questions. So there can be some back and forth. And I want to apologize in advance because at 3.15, I'm going to get up and walk out of the room and go to the airport because I was unable to change my flight. That is the height of rudeness and is also represents a missed opportunity for me because I like to hang out and talk to folks afterwards. So I apologize in advance for that. When I go, I will simply leave it to the panel to wind things, to wind things up and shove you out the door. 
they stand ready to do that. Okay, we've read the Future of Journalism articles that grapple with this period of, of transition, and there's a certain theme in those articles that goes like this. Used to be we could all participate in conversations around the water cooler. You know, we didn't have very many media outlets, but those few outlets had to make news for everyone. So even though there were some problems, at least we had a shared kind of conversation, and for some reason it always happened around a water cooler. Uh, but now things have splintered, and people can select their own media that only shares their ideas and only reinforces what they already believe in, and it has a point of view, and it doesn't present people with views that challenge their own. Now, many of us, when we're hearing that conversation, you know, my eyebrow just arcs, you know, up into my hairline, and I think, you know, some people were never around that water cooler in the first place, and those traditional outlets did not make news for everyone, and they also had a point of view for the simple reason that it's, it's impossible not to. Story selection is judgment. Source selection is judgment. So for some of us, a conversation about how to preserve or protect traditional journalism through this digital transition is not the conversation we want to have, exactly. We don't want to preserve the traditional journalism that has misled the public into war after war, vigorously stifled the debate on expanding access to health care, that routinely presents black and brown people as pathological, women as inferior, poor people as invisible, and gays and lesbians as arguably not deserving of basic human rights. Uh, we don't really want to preserve that journalism that essentially every day in every way is telling us that a society driven by the priorities and values of profit-making corporations is not just the best society, but it's the only possible one. So what does it look like to make news as if powerless people mattered along with powerful people? And wouldn't it be powerful if we could tell our own stories in our own voices, but tell them to one another? So, with that in mind, I'm going to put my first, uh, I love being moderator because I get to have questions and not answers. Uh, and these are really questions. Um, I, these are not decided things. These are emerging things that we need to think about. So let me start off with a, 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 an anecdote. A few years ago, I was in a bookstore, a pretty small bookstore, and it had that, uh, that you know, two shelves of African-American interest, you know, and... Um, I saw Toni Morrison, Beloved, in that, in that section. And then I went to the general fiction section, and it was not there. And I, you know, I wasn't feeling confrontational. I didn't even know really what I was thinking. But as I left, I, I asked the, the gentleman at the front, do you not believe that the Pulitzer Prize winner is of general interest. And he said, people move it. We put it in the fiction section, and people move it back to the African-American section, as if to say, don't, don't take this from us, you know. Now, my forehead was wrinkled the whole rest of the afternoon. Is that, is that good? Do we want, to, you know, is that bad? That, is that right? Is that wrong? And this brings me to this question of special sections. Because I think, thank goodness, here's a place where these stories, stories of you know, women, of people of color, of people with disabilities, of a whole range of underrepresented groups, here's a place where these stories can be told, not just as an asterisk, you know, like um, once a year, let's check in on Latinos, how are Latinos doing? <laughs> um, but at the same time, I also think, well, I want, I want white people to be reading this piece about racism in the criminal justice system. I want men to be reading this story about, about rape as a, as a war crime. I, I don't, you know, especially given that so much of what we want to talk about is not just about communities, but about their relationships to one another. So I don't believe that there can be a single outlet for everyone. But I do want recognition that this, too, is news. 
not special interest news, but news. So, so help me out here. Should we be happy when Huffington Post, for example, says, okay, now we're gonna have an African-American section? You know, we, and uh, is that a way forward? Is that a step back? H how do we feel about that? I actually am not opposed to that. And this is the reason that if you look at the media today, the regular newspaper, and the percentage of stories about people of color, about the LGBT community, is very minimal. At least when you say there is a section that obligates that site to actually do some reporting. And for my, from my point of view, it is better to at least have it somewhere. It is better to have that two shelves where people can go. And even if it's not necessarily being read by everybody, we're reading it. And there was a time when mainstream press never covered African Americans anyway, but the black press was very significant and very significant, in fact, in pushing forward the civil rights movement. I mean, the white press didn't cover Emmett Till, but Emmett Till launched the civil rights movement. So I, it's not ideal, but I think that it's a start. And my opinion is that we should be happy about that, but we should not be satisfied with that. We should be striving to have not only our special section, but we should be striving to be uh, in, represented in the, what we would call the mainstream section. Uh, Latinos, I think, are even more at a disadvantage sometimes because oftentimes people think that doing special coverage for Latinos would mean and can only be done in Spanish. And so we'd have to have a Spanish section or we'd have to translate everything. Well, here I am to say to you that Latinos come in all shapes, sizes, and linguistic abilities in this country. Obviously, I'm speaking to you in English. And uh, just went yesterday to uh, Providence, Rhode Island, where in Cranston, Rhode Island, there is a Spanish language uh, public radio station and I said to them, I'm sorry, but I feel more comfortable in English. And they said, oh, fine, we'll switch over to English for you. So they switched over. And there's people that can do the bilingual thing, too. So I think, again, we should be happy but not satisfied. I, um, I used to work in a bookstore, so that analogy hits very hard home for me. And, and I feel like the answer to that question is to stock more damn Toni Morrison. Um, <laughs> And I, and I also know how unrealistic that is in, in that I worked for a small, underfunded feminist bookstore where we couldn't always have as much in stock as we wanted to, and we grappled with this exact question. I, I know this example personally. Um, as it applies to media in general, I, kind, I, I agree with what, what both people have said, but I think that we have to recognize that this is the beginning of the question, right? This is the very, and, and of course we're at the beginning of our conversation, um, but you know, we see there have been a lot of websites in the past couple of years that have come up with women's pages, right? Uh, Slate had double X and then they folded double X back in, but it still has its own category. You know, you see it different places. And um, it's true that it at least creates space where there wasn't space before sometimes. It creates a certain quota and that's a place to start, but numbers are, Numbers are tricky, right? You know, th the question also is what kind of coverage? You know, Double X launched with a, with kind of a broadside against feminism, um, and, and how troubled and, and irrelevant feminism was. You know, are those women's pages that we want? So, um, you know, I, I have to you have to ask questions sort of beyond that, which is what is the quality and what's going to happen from there, right? So the writers that start cutting their teeth there, which is great because you're not only getting stories out, but you're also giving people opportunities to learn journalism and to practice journalism who weren't having those opportunities before. But are they going to get the same kind of mentoring and promotional opportunity? You know, like so it's it's the, just the very beginning of the question. I don't think there's anything wrong with it per se, but there's so much wrong with everything else that, that we, <laughs> you know, that, you know, if we had a really equal media and then there were also women's pages and African-American, you know, all these other things, great. Um, it's, it's sort of the whole rest of the picture that I object to. Well, on that subject, um, you know, the, the question of what do I think about uh, a black section for Huffington Post, my concern is who owns Huffington Post. The fact that it is now a, a corporate entity 
um, and a brand that now is definitively not associated with the politics that I came to understand haltingly. Um, that is a far greater concern for me. Um, as someone who's written for the Huffington Post, um, its uh, veneer is gone. It was gone before um, the acquisition took place because the business model is free labor off of uh, cultural creatives, uh, people who have something to say and um, Huffington Post profiting from it 100%. You get to say that you wrote for Huffington Post and if that helps you, Great, I think most people think that it could or should help help you. Probably not. It's nice to say in a conversation, I wrote for Huffington Post. Well, you and 8,000 other people for free, and uh, meanwhile, the rich are getting richer. And in this case, um, this is a fabulous situation for Ariana Huffington. And can I just say something more about, I, I agree entirely with that, but, but and, and furthermore, they were making money off of selling images of celebrity nip slips and like you know simultaneously with the progressive politics are selling women's bodies and you know and it, and it really does get to the question of counting right so this is actually a woman owned or was until recently a woman owned media outlet um, and that's why counting is inadequate right so it's not enough to say I think ownership is really important and we need to talk about diversity and ownership which is very which is in a it's a crisis situation as it always has been but but also counting is not enough And of course, there is the concern that an outlet that establishes a, a women's section or an African-American section will then feel absolved of its responsibility to address those concerns uh, in, in its main piece. At the same time, they may feel, hey, we need to hire a woman because we're going to do a woman's piece. You know, there may actually be opportunities there. So I think we all see the the double edge of that. So part of the work maybe is not just creating those new spaces in which voices are allowed to kind of remain whole and speak in their own voice, but also amplifying those spaces. Because it's happening at a good time. After all, we, are, we do have people, citizens, who now recognize that they're not gonna just read one outlet. You know, when I started talking, working at FAIR low these many years ago, the thing people would ask me at the end of the panel was, okay, I'm not gonna read the New York Times anymore. Tell me, what should I read? Can I read the Nation? You know, can I pull out New York Times and plug in Nation and will that do? And there was kind of this desire again to get back to the single source that we're all reading and we all can talk about. I think that's gone now and people sort of recognize that they're gonna be seeking out information on their own. So perhaps this kind of silo metaphor, if people are already actively looking for things, is less of a hazard or of a danger than, than it may have been previously. Well, let's look at a little uh, history here. The, the Kerner Commission, um, back in the late 60s, said that media coverage of black people, in particular, was, was, was part of the problem uh, in the urban unrest in the late 60s. And putting it very crudely, the answer that the Kerner Commission came up with was not, you guys need to try harder you guys should take an ethics class, you know, and kind of try to just be good. It was, you have to have more people of color in your newsrooms, period. And not just so that you won't accidentally say something about Negroes and chicken or something like that, <laughs> but because you missed a story. You missed a reality because you did not have this perspective. And there is no cure for it but to diversify your workforce. The principle then was still one of one newsroom. You know, in other words, the Kerner Commission didn't say we need more black owned media outlets particularly. They said we need, if they're gonna have one newsroom, it has to be an inclusive one. Well, since then we've seen affirmative action in media go forward and go back and go a little forward and go way back. Um, and now the biggest uh, sort of news aggregators, Yahoo and Google won't release their diversity statistics. And the Labor Department backs them up and says those are trade secrets. And they don't need to say how many people. So should we, Chris Rabb, should we shift any of our effort away from trying to get in that room that doesn't want us and towards growing new rooms? I mean, how do you do that balance? Because I'm always saying we can't cede that ground. You know, as much as we people may say, I don't even, 
I don't even read the New York Times anymore, so why do I need to worry about that? I don't even read it. I say, guess what? Everybody you're dealing with is reading it. Yeah, the people you know? who we elect or choose not to uh, elect by not voting or people in positions of power, they read the New York Times. Um, the narratives that are spun um, and are reinforced um, occur f through those institutions. So whether we like the New York Times, trust it, read it, what have you, we still have to have an impact on all the institutions that impact our democracy. Um, that's, that's part of what I consider civic literacy, which is the overarching type of literacy we all need to have as global citizens. Within that, we need to have other forms of literacy. We're talking a lot now about financial literacy, how you have to manage your money better so your house won't go underwater, um, understanding the difference between income and wealth. We also need to understand about political literacy. And in, in my case, um, with regard to my book, entrepreneurial literacy, which is highly related to media literacy. Why? Because all of these entities, or the vast majority, are for profit. Um, they are essentially corporations. So when we talk about corporate media and we talk about, when we talk about corporate America and we talk about media, they, uh, on a Venn diagram, <laughs> there's a lot of overlap, right? Um, so we do need to be fighting for diversifying newsrooms. We also have to be diversifying the structures, the processes, and the impacts of these entities. So if we take Huffington Post for a second, because they're killing me. Um, they're stuck in my proverbial craw, and I don't even know what a craw is. Um, structure, so their, their structure is, um, well, in terms of staffing, they're not particularly diverse. Um, they are now corporate owned. Their processes are to get people to give them content for free and make money off of them through advertising, right? And their impact now that they allow right wing bigots and so forth um, to have a public. I, I don't know if any of you saw this, but they had Andrew Breitbart. Um, front line in this guy and it was because the people the previous allies and colleagues of the original Huffington Post folks shamed them out of uh, pulling him down and first they said oh, well you know da, 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 free speech da, da. and then we just we just beat him up and that's crazy that we have to do that so the fact that it's a woman-owned business or was one the fact that she's an immigrant or however you want to you know to you know massage these narratives Ultimately, it's about the impact. How does, what does it mean when an entity that prized itself on being a, a part of independent media, and at least from a nominal perspective, progressive or left of center, sells to a corporation that has no politics along those lines, and it is one of the premier outlets for getting voices out that are not ordinarily covered in, in mainstream media? I mean, it has a profoundly negative impact um, on all of this. So the type of diversity that we have to talk about kind of is pivoting on multiple axes. So we have to look at corporate media because they are still dominant. We have to look at media consolidation and the consolidation of ownership because everything we do, the top 20 websites, the top newspapers, radios, TV stations, they're all owned by a, a, a decreasing um, group of people, most of whom are white men and who are fabulously wealthy. Um, and even if we I diversify they're that. Not coincidental. Right, they're, they're not coincidental because it requires a great deal of financial capital to own or build a, a scalable media outlet, right? So if we say we need to diversify the ownership in this field, who are the people most likely to take over a TV, radio station, print? These are also highly wealthy people who, and I'm not opposed to wealth, one day I might have it. Um, but you're really talking about the same group of people of different ethnic origins and genders and sexuality. You're talking about um, finding entrepreneurs who are able to run large-scale organizations that require a lot of capital, a lot of sophistication, and those folks may not represent the spectrum of philosophical um, perspectives or values that many of us in this conference really care about. For those of us who care about net neutrality, who care about media justice overall, those things may not be reflected irrespective of who is in the CEO position, who's on the board, and who owns most of the shares. So when we think about this, we have to think, um, we have to honor the complexity of this issue. 
And I think uh, the best thing for us to do is to think about impact. In other words, if everything is working on all cylinders, what would it look like? Would it be one newsroom? You know, would it be one outlet? Would it be, and then work backwards. And my point of reference, and, and I'll wrap this up, is when I think about independent media, I think about activism. And one of the reasons I think about activism is because in my mind's eye, when I think about early journalism in this country, it was around social justice issues from a very multi-ethnic, diverse uh, group of people called abolitionists. Anyone heard of an abolitionist before? Raise your hand. I'm fond of their legacy. <laughs> I think all of us in this room should be fond of their legacy too. We're the original freedom fighters, multiracial women, men, young, old. They use the press and the Constitution to support their efforts, even when the system itself was fighting against their existence and their cause. And in many senses, we are reinventing that spirit. And I think that is the way in which we have to look towards the future. I do want to say, though, that I think that more diversity at the level of ownership and top management would go would, would help. Right? I already obviously said, you know, that it's the accounting is not enough, but that y you do have more odds of having more representative media if the decision makers are more representative. They're not going. You're, they're always going to be elites, right? They're always going to be, but but they might be elites with different backgrounds who are got to be elites in a different way and and have different families and different connections to different communities. I, I really do think that. We have to think about ownership. Um, I heard a story today which exemplifies this perfectly, which is uh, Yana Wilson from the Women's Media Center was speaking uh, at an earlier session, and she said that a lot of times when she's pitching stories to Fox News, to producers at Fox, uh, the producers will say, like, Yana, we just want you to know we're totally on your team, right? And those are the producers, right? They're in the newsroom, right? But that, but they don't, Rupert Murdoch is making those decisions, right? And, and it, we have to be talking not, I, I think that newsroom diversity is important, but that what happens is the top bosses are replicating, you know, the world they want to live in. And, and some of them are doing it maliciously intentionally, but I think that there are also lots of, there are even progressive newsrooms where, the top bosses are, they're mentoring the young guns who remind them of themselves, right? It, it can also happen passively. Like we see this uh, on Wikipedia. I wanna talk about Wikipedia for a second because there was a study that came out uh, a couple months ago that said only 13% of authors on Wikipedia are women. Um, now Wikipedia is a pretty democratic format, right? There's, there aren't any bosses deciding what gets written about on Wikipedia. Um, although it's certainly been created by a man, a white guy, you know, like it's a structure created by a white guy. But um, as structures go, it's, it's sort of a passive structure. Like we bring to it what we bring to it. But it, the community, the structures that we're all living in, the oppressive structures that we live in are re replicating themselves. So several things are, are happening there. One is that women are raised and we don't see ourselves as experts in the news media already. Um, and so we don't think of ourselves as experts, and so we're less likely to put ourselves out there and think like, I'm an expert on this subject, and I should write a Wikipedia entry on it, or I should edit that. We don't think about putting ourselves out there in the same way because this replicates itself. And the other thing that happens is if a woman does go in, there's already sort of like this geek boy tech culture on Wikipedia that speaks a particular language that you have to defend yourself to. No one is doing this on purpose on Wikipedia, except for probably a few assholes, but, oh, I swore. <laughs> Sorry, we had a conversation about the Mickey Minning. <laughs> um, but, but it still winds up, so even, I mean, I think Rupert Murdoch is one category, and I think that he's pretty evil, right? And he's doing a lot of things on purpose, right? In his own interest. But I think that even in a well-intentioned community where there's no active intention to change the status quo, you're going to see the status quo replicated for all of these social forces. So there's a lot, there's a lot to push back against. I'm, I'm not proposing a lot of great solutions here, but um, <laughs> but that it's, it, it goes much deeper than, um, you know, kick the bums out. I think we need to be very cautious of thinking that diversity will change news content, even at the ownership level. Because historically, we're not just looking at putting people of color or women in, we're talking about a structure not only at the institutional level, the business level, but how journalists are trained and how the newsroom is organized that really has an impact on how news is produced. The Kerner Commission, they actually made a couple of points. One was, we need diversity. 
They also said, and this is what everybody ignored, we need an institute of urban education to train people how to deal with issues in inner city communities. And not only do white reporters have to go to this, everybody has to go to this. And that is the one thing that has been lost in this discussion of journalism. What Kerner was advocating was that you would actually place advocates for African Americans and poor people into newsrooms and that these individuals would actually do the reporting. We've had the diversity. Um, and it was about 3% in 1968, which is terrible. And in 1978, uh, American Society of Newspaper Editors said we would have parity, meaning as many people of color in the society would be in the newsrooms. By 2000, they failed badly. But it did go from 3% to 14%, and now it's down to 12%. But there has been an increase in diversity. Has there been an increase in how African Americans or women are actually covered? Has there been an improvement? No. Studies show that it's not the case at all, even with this increase. And real quick, to even tell an anecdote of myself, I went to a job. My last job was in upstate New York as a social issues reporter. Uh, because of the structural changes, because they lost money, they cut that position and put it into a suburban position because they've, they're the readers. I ended up being a police reporter. <coughs> and somebody came up to me in the courthouse one time and said, you're racist. I'm like, I, I'm not racist. I'm black. It's like, why don't you go back and read your stories? I was racist. Even though I considered myself to be conscious, I was writing narratives of African-American men being incarcerated without any context. That is a part of my training. And I think that this is a very complex issue. So we may increase diversity, even in ownership. But that may not change the actual content that is being produced. Even some of the sites that are produced by people of color are still problematic. Uh, historically, there have been a lot of African-American newspapers that have been problematic, especially the ones written by Booker T. Washington. Now imagine if Juan Williams becomes ownership. Well, why you say that? <laughs> um, I'm, um, but to, to, to summarize, I mean, it's, it's one, the, the Kerner Commission said news was coming from white men's eyes from a white perspective. But if we're just changing the colors of the people involved, it's through it may be just through black men's eyes, but still through a white perspective. I agree with that in terms of uh, what is a perspective, because we always talk about the Latino's perspective, and there isn't one Latino perspective. Uh, a Cuban is going to look at a question of immigration a lot different than a Mexican or a Mexican-American. Uh, as I sit up here in this panel, uh, as we're looking at perspective, I sit here in this panel, and I'm looking at you, looking at us, and I'm thinking, how much longer is this panel? Uh, it, will I be able to keep a f up a facade of some kind of uh, authority, uh, uh, good grammar, and not curse? Uh, and <laughs> not curse. Uh, and you're sitting there, looking at this panel, going, what are these folks talking about? Do I have time to text? Perhaps I can go out and, and catch the panel that is next door, and it's probably more interesting, et cetera. <laughs> You know, so perspective is exactly the filter through which you are looking at the same incident. So when the uh, stuff happened, came down in uh, Arizona, where people were saying we should uh, give the police the power to stop uh, Latinos and ask them, are they citizens? And if they aren't citizens, well, then we'll do something about that. The perspective was quite different from people, Latinos living in Arizona to Latinos living outside of Arizona. Outside of Arizona, people were saying, let's boycott Arizona. Well, what's happening with Latina housekeeper in the hotel where people are no longer coming? Perhaps she's going to lose her job. And her perspective on boycotting was wholly different. So even within one group, you're right. The diversity is not the... the, the a cure-all. Ownership is not the cure-all. This is such a complex question that there are many, many facets to it, and whatever you can do to solve it, you should do. One of the things in terms of ownership that I think that you all should look seriously at is the low-power FM. 
Low Power FM takes little money compared to what it is to own a full power FM. And if you are able to control that means of communication at the local level, and perhaps somebody's going to come up with a scheme to interconnect all of the different low powers and eventually make money, because look at what happened with cable. Cable was such a little stepchild thing, you know? And uh, I know some people at this conference who made a lot of money on cable, but you would never be able to tell that because they are completely unassuming people. You know, they have progressive politics and they're trying to continue to push that through cable, but then meanwhile, cable just took off. So do whatever you can. Well, we're, so we're talking about then, re, in some ways, redefining what news is. We certainly have all seen uh, mixed, diverse groups of journalists produce the same old news. And it does have to do with the structure and the climate, the institutional climate within which they exist. So part of, so what we want is a different definition of news that, that says that news is no longer defined as what powerful people say and do. And, you know, I got nothing against white men. I'm married to one, you know. Lots of folks can do, it's a set of values that you bring to it. I always feel bad in some ways for, for white people when I read a story that says, you know, a, a black, some terrible harm was done to a black person and black people are upset about it. White people who are upset about it too. They're just made invisible in that in that space, you know. Only women care about women's rights issues. Well, no, I, I every man in my life cares about women's rights issues, and yet they're erased constantly. Uh, so we're talking about a different definition. So let's get concrete about it. Uh, Latrell, how do you see your mission day to day? To what extent is it about filling in gaps and countering narratives? and how much kind of replacing them as a news source. You've worked in mainstream newsrooms. How is your day different, or is it different, from that of a, you know, a city daily, another city daily reporter? Thank you. Um, our goal with um, the publication, the online publication that uh, I produced with uh, a friend of mine for years, Morley Balaji, our goal is to allow citizens and train citizens to do the journalism. How do you avoid having something come from a perspective that is not their own? Give people the tools to do their own journalism and allow them to produce their own journalism. I think this is time. I'm gonna show you a clip of a project that I'm actually working on just to set it up with a, a Philly Cam, you know, Philadelphia Access Media. We, with Voice of Philadelphia, and through funding, generous funding of JLab, uh, are working with a group of so-called dropouts to have them produce their own story on the epidemic of dropping out in Philadelphia. But I say so-called because they came to us and said, we're not dropouts, we're pushouts. And this little clip that I'm about to show is, uh, part of a documentary that we hope to have done uh, within the next few months. Talk amongst yourselves. Stop talking. I dropped out because it wasn't really a structure for me. And it was a different environment from coming from Catholic school to public school. It was just too much freedom. I couldn't agree with it. It was just too much for me to handle. I got a little mutual fight, like, regular fight, got out of hand. Nothing negative, nothing bad. I just had to get out of the 
friends about to go to go ahead. I let something small turn in something. B, something, something real B. It wasn't that serious, but I made it serious as I was younger, rebellious. I'm learning, I'm paying for my mistakes now, every day. The school, um, I would say I could, I could have been an A, B student, but at the time I was a C, D student. I had staff and counselors and stuff in there, but at the same time, I felt as though I can't even trust them either. My name is Will. My name is Mary Simmons. My name is Dennis Mason. And my name is John Reddick. My name is Zachary Lee. My name is Dante Antonio Chestnut. We're trying to basically defeat the stereotype for high school dropouts. The stereotypes nowadays is that we dropped out for one reason, to be lazy. Be stupid, good for nothing, waste of space. We're not calling it dropouts anymore. It's pushed out because we were pushed over the edge. It's not one basic answer. People don't know, they don't understand what's the reason, like, like the outcome, like where they live it, like what's going on in their household, like what they going through every day. Nine times out of ten, most people who didn't drop out of school, they were pushed out for some unknown reason. Financial, house problems, anything. We're gonna basically tell you our story from our perspective not from the media or anybody else that comes out, it's from us. So you're gonna hear from the source. Um, I felt as though I can't even trust them either. My name is Will. My name is Mary Simmons. My name is Dennis Mason. And my name is J And let me be clear. They are producing the documentary. We, I helped them with interviewing. Uh, Philly Cam helped with the digital technology. But this is a group that most people would think can't do something like this that is telling their own story. That is journalism. At the end of the day, forget professional ethics. I teach all this stuff. Forget all that. If we can tell people you can write, you can tell your own story, that is journalism. And the online platform allows today for these voices to get out. Now, net neutrality threatens all of this, but that's a different, we'll get into that later. But for the time being, I think that this is how we can increase diversity, not by, because honestly, the corporations, I don't know if we can do anything about this, but this is something that we can tangibly do to empower people to get their own voices uh, out. I totally agree, and I think that's a, it's a fantastic project, but it raises for me the question of how it's received and who believes that it's credible, who believes, um, who believes who, who's, who's believed as credible in the news. So um, there's a question of production, and, but then there's also the question of reception and sort of the consumption, as we often think about it, right, of the news. And, and who, in the, who is believable as an expert in the news media is a, is a much trickier thing to change than how to produce our own media. Um, you know, whose tone and whose approach is acceptable. And when we think about, um, I don't know how many of you follow, the New York Times did a total puff piece on this sort of, you know, Ezra Klein set of, you know, white boy bloggers taking over DC, et cetera. And um, it totally left out people of color, women, like it was just like this same old, same old. The only woman who's mentioned was like listed as one of the bloggers' girlfriends and she's a journalist in her own, right? It was a very problematic article. Um, and it, there were, I, we had a lot of conversations with this on, uh, at WAM, and uh, one of the things that was brought up was that um, the, the approach of this subset of guys who are now seen as like the new guard, you know, taking over, they're very sort of wonky and detached about politics. Well, now why are they wonky and detached about politics? Because it can be, right? Because that's privilege, right? Um, and, and, and yet, if, if they, if one of them were to become passionate and emotional about a subject, that would be seen as exceptional and we would la laud it. Now, I had an experience recently, uh, I had a debate with Naomi Wolf about the charges, against, the rape charges against Assange, and we can, they we're not talking about that subject, by the way, um, but I bring it up because I heard feedback from that uh, piece, I, I got a ton of mail, um, and a lot of people who, who emailed to hate on me emailed to tell me that I had been too emotional and therefore was not credible. Now, this is a conversation about sexual violence, and I am a sexual violence survivor, and I was speaking as such. And to hear that 
there's no room for me to have a feeling, right, to express passion for a subject that has impacted my life and my body so materially, and that makes me not credible. If you want to argue with my arguments, that's fine, right? But these weren't, no one was saying, like, I think you're wrong because you said this, and here's how I disagree with you. They were saying, you showed emotion, and therefore you lost. Um, whereas if that was Jon Stewart taking on Bill O'Reilly, right, we'd be like, yeah, he's so bad, you know? So the question is, for me, and, and again, yet a question I don't have, I'm sorry, I'm usurping the moderator position. <laughs> a question I don't have an answer to is sort of like, how do we make a cultural shift so that when we do produce our own media and we do get people telling their own stories, like that, 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 we, that different people's approaches to storytelling is believed as credible and not just the white guy privilege model of, a, of how to tell a story. But isn't the way we do that by doing it, you know? In other words, um, whenever we go to news outlets and say you don't, you're underrepresenting a whole range of people, the response is often, well, like the response we got from the news hour uh, when we did that study years ago and subsequently was kind of like, oh, well, you know, we interview people of color and, you know, immigrants or, you know, those people, but they can't always come into the studio and put on a suit and tie and, you know, in other words, there's a box and they don't fit in it. Well, part of what we're saying is the box is the problem. So we're talking about redefining who's an expert, redefining who gets to legitimately speak. And I think, to some extent, I think the only way is to make the road by walking. In other words, you see something like that, and then if you see something else like that and more like that, then you, you learn to hear that voice without asking that voice necessarily to talk in the same way and, and do a, you know, a be Chet Huntley or whatever, or whatever, you know, so. I, I, wow. Whew. <laughs> Let's talk about passion. Uh, and I, I always joke about using profanity. We had a little joke about it before because um, I, I was uh, raised in a mixed family. My, my mother is African-American and my father was Negro. <laughs> and Negro, they didn't curse. On my mom's side, they use very colorful language. They loved language. And so I have a kind of huxtable sensibility from my father, and I have this really irreverent side from my mother's side of the family. And um, my mother's side of the family is really, really passionate, and they curse, um, and they love language, and they love justice and family and all of these things. And I think that there is a great desire, a hunger for the type of passion people like you who bring to it who say, I don't want to talk about rape in an academic context. I, I talk about rape as a man all the time from my sensibility as a genealogist and family historian and the reason I look the way I do, that's rape. It's pre-Civil War rape, but it's rape. And I think there's a, a great desire for the, the range of perspectives and for passion that people bring, even though it is not the standard. And what we're seeing is what is the standard in terms of news delivery and news content is not so popular. I haven't watched network news since the 80s. I don't, I mean, I just, it does nothing for me. I read more content on my iPhone from different uh, sources than all of the, 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 the time I, I watched the news with my parents at the dinner table. It's just, it's gone, so I think we have to honor the fact that there's a great desire for things that do not currently exist or do not exist um, despite the fact that they come from abundance. And what I mean by that is we live in a, in a world and a country in particular that is all about scarcity, a zero-sum game. We are the wealthy. We're taking from the poor. Um, this is ours. You guys fight over the scraps. It's scarcity. But the reality is, and I think the spirit of conferences like this is, we come from communities of abundance, abundance of love, of creativity, of innovation. Um, that's what fuels justice. That's what fuels art and beauty. That's what is, that is at the core of anything good that will ever come from a collective group. And I think that one thing we have to do is we have to be unapologetically passionate and profane. Fuck it. I said it. And secondly, we, whenever we have wonderful A-list folks asked to speak, or we are in a position to ask, ooh, how can we get Cornell West, who I love? Um, the next time we ask him, we don't say, hey, brother, can you come speak to our group? We say, 
what powerful sister who is under the age of 35 that you could recommend to speak? Or, you know, can you recommend someone who's openly gay, who is just a master of this issue? Someone from Appalachia. Someone, because you know what? The beauty of people like Cornell West and others is that they don't surround themselves with people who look and act just like them. The, the wisest person in the room is someone who realizes that they, in fact, uh, are surrounded by people who have all forms of intelligence that make them think better and, and feel better about themselves in the world. So that's something that we all can do. We can say, who can we bring into the conversation who otherwise wouldn't be asked to speak? You know, I've spoken here for three, I don't know, three or four times over the past five or six years. I, I want to recommend other people who would never have this opportunity, have never heard of this conference, who've never uh, spent time in a hotel, been on an airplane. Those people have value, too. So when we talk about diversity and perspectives, we're really talking about a wide, wide range. It's not how many slots in terms of ethnics that we can fill, because the reality is white folk are ethnic, too. That's not the issue. It's really about the broad panoply of, of, of expression that's going to help move this movement forward in terms of media justice and the type of media reform that's really going to allow for our democracy to flourish, because right now it's really bedraggled. And when you talk about passion being acceptable, it also depends on who's listening. And if somebody who is not seeing themselves in media, not hearing themselves on the radio, is not even paying attention to that, then when you speak, or when Latinos create their own radio stations, and they're speaking passionately about something that interests them, then the people will begin to listen. And so I think that we need to not only create our own media, but we need to be included in passionate speeches in mainstream media. We need to recognize that this country is one that has potential audiences living uh, in temporary camps along the vegetable and fruit fields of this country, as well as on reservations, as well as uh, you know, down in Miami, Florida, along the retirement villages. So you know, there's a, a lot of diversity in this country that needs to be addressed uh, passionately, accurately, and in their own voices. I think that's a wonderful time to uh, move to questions, but I want to give the panelists uh, an opportunity to make any comments now on the general questions, if you'd like to, before we open it to questions, if anyone has something. I do want to be a little bit of a wet blanket for a second. I'm sorry. We're having such a great love-in up here, and I, I, I'm, I'm feeling so energized and so juicy and passionate about it, right? Um, but... But I don't want, I agree with Janine, I don't want to see the corporate media, right? Because in reality, the power structures are replicating themselves in part based on the corporate media. Like the people who run the country, the, you know, the, they're not hearing, it, we can make this media for each other and we can learn how to hear each other's voices better and we can do all this stuff. But if we don't change the status quo at Fox News and the New York Times, um, or even at our, you know, even at you know, the American prospect, you know, where it, the, the situation replicates itself. Even the, even the lefty progressive media, you see m most often the superstars, the people who get groomed and rise to the top, a lot of times are, are following the same pattern. And, and those are the people whose opinions start to shape the people whose opinions shape the country and the circumstances we live in. Um, and I, I just, I just want to put a pin in that, right? Like, I, I don't have any grand solutions except that I think that we need to really th be thoughtful about paying for media. Um, paying for media that we want to see more of in the world. I know that not all of us have lots of income, right? But that we can all pay a little bit, most of us anyway, can pay a little bit for some kind of media that matters to us. That, uh, one of the things that I take great heart in is the fact that in terms of newspapers, in terms of print, the only sector of print that I'm aware of that's growing in this country is ethnic media. Um, ethnic media, um, that's, you know, community ethnic newspapers um, are, are actually a growing sector. And so there are needs and there are audiences, but we have, it's on us. We can make, we are a huge block if we were actually to start deliberately paying for media that we wanted to replicate. We want more of this. For, for me, that's Mother Jones right now, personally. Mother Jones is kicking ass and taking names in terms of progressive journalism, in terms of diversity, right? Like, they, um, 
they integrate it. They're not, you know, they're not bitch magazine. They're not color lines. They're not a specialty magazine. But at the same time, they're really bringing in all of those perspectives to their everyday reporting, and I love how they're doing that. And if that means that I can give them $10, $20 a year for a subscription, I'm, I'm making that a priority. I do not make a lot of money. I'm not doing that for a lot of other publications, right? But even if there's one thing, one media source that we can pay for, we can start to be a block that needs to be courted, right? And, and that's when we start to have power because the New York Times is pissing themselves right now. <laughs> and that's the reality, and that gives us an opportunity, but we need to organize around that opportunity somehow. I don't have a grand scheme, but I do think that money and the way we spend our own damn money is part of it. I agree with you. Um, I would say this, that one, I don't think you're going to change the big media. You're not going to, you, you don't have, you're not going to get congressional backing. We've seen what has happened when we had a huge majority and everything went down the toilet. So honestly, I've given up almost on that end. But we have these grassroots networks that are out there doing solid news across the nation. In terms of a grand scheme, I think that we need to find ways to aggregate all of these wonderful news stories coming from the grassroots level and have the source where everybody can go and see what's happening in these various communities where this can get out. Because let's be honest, we're a small group. Um, it'll be on Philadelphia Access Media, which is important, but it may not reach the masses that it could. It may not have the impact that it could. And the other thing that I've realized from this conference is that what I do with Morley Bellagi is not special. There are dozens, hundreds of groups doing the exact same thing in cities across the nation. We need to find a way where Okay, screw Fox News. You don't have to watch that. Screw the New York Times. We're going to have uh, television stations, even if it's just online. We're going to have an aggregate news source where this is where the authentic news from the people is coming. And that's, I think we have to find out ways funding. I don't know how to do it, but if we can do that, I think that we can usurp this whole issue of the corporate media. Is that idealistic? Of course. But... <laughs> I don't know of anything else we can do at this point. We talked about the, um, the water cooler, conversing around the water cooler. There was a time when migrant workers in the fields of California didn't even have water given to them, so they couldn't stand around and talk about the news of the day. Um, Cesar Chavez and radio networks like Radio Campesina, Radio Bilingue, public radio stations addressed those questions. And before you knew it, there were fighters in the fields and there were boycotts and there were huelgas. And they were all able to come together and talk about those issues. It is important for public broadcasting and it is the very element, to the, the basic foundation of public broadcasting to be able to bring new faces to the national conversation we want to provide them in-depth information that allows them to do more than vote for who's the next American idol. We want them to be able to vote for the President of the United States with as much knowledge and as much conviction in their choices as any other American. And so um, I, I think everybody up here is right that we need to continue to support all of the efforts that are going on and somehow find a way to give all of those efforts national voice. So speaking in our own voices, but amplifying that voice without neutralizing it. Um, okay, uh, we can now take some questions. I, is there a mic, should I hand this mic out? You said that you're giving the students or the, the push-outs and the people tools to uh, tell their stories. What, what tools are you doing to, what are you giving to support them? Uh, basically, the project started, we essentially engaged in journalism training. We basically taught them how to do journalism. So uh, my major piece was teaching them how to ask questions and how to do fault, solve follow-up questions. Um, and also, we did a lot of encouragement. Um, I talked about the black press. I, told them that there were people like Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth 
who made a huge impact with media, but they didn't necessarily have the education that people will tell you that they had. And they have been inspired. And the other day, um, we actually had a little issue with uh, getting all the equipment ready, and they were like, we want the equipment now. We're, we're eager to do this project. So once we showed them, okay, this is how you do this, this is how you do that, they have taken this on their own. And this is just with students, and I don't just want to make it sound like we're a youth media organization. I think youth media is great, but uh, we're talking about uh, next project would be working with immigrant communities, Hmong immigrant community in Philadelphia to have that story told. Um, even, and, and this is something that you can pass on to everybody. My mother is a domestic violence survivor. She came to me the other day and said, I want to learn how to do journalism. I want to write my story. Can you please recommend somebody to teach me? And I was like, <laughs> Mom, uh... But the point being that there are a lot of people out there that want and are eager to write their own narratives. It's just a matter of uh, finding a way to do that. And that's what we're doing. And we certainly need to do some tweaks with our program, but uh, that's the essential tool. How do you write? How do you ask interviews? How do you use the camera? How do you edit? Basic things. And they, and they have done an excellent job. I had a chance to take a race and media class at the University of Wisconsin last semester. And I think one of the real revelations was, I think Jacqueline brought this point out, that ethnic minority presses are among the healthiest. And, and you know, they're going in the right direction. They're doing the right things. I wonder if you all could just comment on why that might be true. I think one of the things our professor brought out is, is they're using the new media and they're using participatory methods to get people to tell their own stories. Is that resonant with your experiences? And, and how do we make sure that they don't go the path of concentration of ownership, all the things that have destroyed the mainstream media? I uh, used to uh, serve on the board of the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper. It was founded in 1893 by my great-great-grandfather. Uh, so this is personal to me. Um, I was the, the youngest person on the board and the first person of my generation, the fifth generation. Um, and I was pushing technology and the web from day one, and it was an uphill fight. A lot of the traditional ethnic media, the print outlets, have been slow and are not scaling out. I think the subset of um, communities of color in media that you are referring to represent non-traditional newer folks who embrace innovation. And part of that is if, if, if Boston Globe and New York Times are dying on the vine, they're, they're, they're um, laying off folks, they're, they're concerned about their business model, I mean, who are the first to be laid off, right? I mean, who, the, you're creating, the challenge creates the opportunity. The opportunity is born out of those challenges, which means this is a highly entrepreneurial time. The problem, of course, is um, at least in the African-American com community, we have one-tenth the wealth of our white counterparts. So the highly competent people who have the skills, experiences, resources, et cetera, do not have the financial capital to uh, leverage all of that to create scalable entities that will do what a lot of us would like in this room to do. Um, and that's a challenge. That means that's a challenge to philanthropic resources, um, corporate, governmental, et cetera. And that's the conversation that I have in my book, I, I know this is promoting. <clears throat> oh, thank you. You shouldn't. No, you shouldn't have. Stop it. No, really. You're 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 embarrassing me. It is available at invisiblecapital.com. But that that's the my, my point is that um, there is the there is a great will to do this. There are certain trends that are very um, positive. Um, we have to situate this opportunity um, in a context where we understand what are the structures and processes by which we can create media outlets that are what I call uh, commonwealth enterprises. And those are entities, for-profit or non-profit, that in their very operation create community assets. And those are forms of wealth that we often don't think about because sometimes the market does not value them. And just as proof of that, raise your hand if you have something on your body, in your purse, your wallet, your bag, that you would not sell. Something that's priceless to you. Now look around the room and see how many people raise their hands. Now, that's a form of wealth that you're not going to hear about on Wall Street. You're not going to hear about in corporate media. But the reality is 
Those are forms of wealth, too. Those are assets you care very deeply about. And one of the reasons is because you have deep, profound stories around why you possess that thing and what you have imbued it with. And part of that is the beauty of media. And we have to create that capacity, um, not just what Latrell is doing or Jacqueline or Florence. I mean, we're really talking about um, emboldening our democracy. And this is probably one of the best uh, enterprises in America that has the greatest multiplier effect other than starting um, child care centers of high quality, quite frankly. And uh, this, the next conversation, these spin-off conversations we have from panels like this should be looking at how do we capitalize these things, how do we structure them in ways that build capacity. Hi, I'm Cheryl Lianza. First, I just have to say, I just bought your book online. Um, <laughs> only four left on Amazon five eight-star reviews or eight five-star reviews. Anyway, um, my question was that uh, you were all talking. I sort of wanted to bring it back to a little bit more of a practical question, because earlier you talked about, you know, one of the issues is does it matter who owns the media, and sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, from my perspective, one of the reasons that it doesn't is often, if, even if it's a person of color or if it's a woman who owns the media, they're still trying to compete in the same stupid broken marketplace that, that the pe white people are competing in, and so they wind up responding to the same pressures, um, but at the same time, it was, you know, when Jacqueline started talking, I had this question formulated, but that's exactly what I was thinking about is, media is a way to make money, right? Like, I mean, a lot of people make money about it, and what I keep thinking is now that we're getting to a place where the technology is so much more open and you don't need the same level of capitalization to create an entry point to, to reach a mass audience, do you guys have any uh, places where you can point to or ideas or models that talk about how you know, people of color, women, people who are not represented in the media can successfully start an entrepreneurial enterprise that brings these stories forward that can actually make money, you know, so that they would build that capital. And so you're simultaneously starting a business, but you're also, you know, enhancing our civic and cultural debate. I don't know about money making. I do want to po point out Oakland Local, which is Susan Mernitz. Uh, <laughs> are you from Oakland Local? All right. <laughs> Oakland Local is this great uh, website hub for Oakland-generated news online, um, and it's been a huge success. I, I honestly don't know what their financials are right now, um, but but it's very replicable for other communities, and, and Susan is a great person to talk to, or whoever is in the back. Um, <laughs> um, and But the other thing I want to point out before other people who may <laughs> actually know about financially successful models um, is that not only does media co uh, can make money, but media actually... Journalism, a lot of it does cost money, right? Like, it's not, uh, there's a whole issue about people getting rich off of media, which is important, but, but, I, but invest, real journalism, investigative journalism, having beat reporters covering City Hall or, you know, a long-term investigation, the stuff that we need to make our democracy go, it actually does cost money to do. Um, and we need to not forget that also. I'm all for citizen journalism, but the reality is that we also do need journalists who are paid to be journalists, whose lives are about journalism, because they are, without them, we have no democracy. Um, and I just sort of want to insert that into the conversation. Does anyone know successful financial models that we can replicate? Well, uh, it depends on how you define success. Like, I just did a little, you know, test about your understanding of wealth. I, I dare say you would give up whatever's on your body because you say, well, it's not wealth, so you can just take it. No, you're not giving up your grandma's brooch or something. No, that's near and dear to you. How do we define success? Uh, what does it mean in terms of your interest or level of, of personal wealth, uh, financial wealth, um, financial sustainability for your, your family or for this group of founding members of your, of your local media entity? What, what is success, right? Is it that your entity will survive you, that it will go beyond founderitis, right? Um, is it that you will have ridiculous wealth and you will be hanging out with Ariana Huffington? That all <laughs> depends, but the thing is, if we don't define these terms, we don't define diversity, if we don't define what the news is, uh, we don't define success or wealth, then um, what happens is we're belaboring points that are made by people who don't have the stake in what's in, important in our realities. And so um, there are different forms of success. And so we need structures that honor different forms. So for small scale entities, they're maybe nonprofit and they have a small annual budget. They're able to hire people at a living wage. 
and they're doing important stuff in their communities um, that wouldn't otherwise be done, that's highly, highly successful, right? But if your perspective about success is, how do I put my kids through private school? How do I maintain my you know, uh, second car note and my place in Martha's Vineyard? That's a much higher level. Now, I'm not saying that that's not worthy of discussion because I think they're all levels. But as my grandmother would say, everyone has a role. And there's people who make the good fight in corporate media, and, they, and those people are probably not going to be you and me, but they're folks we know and we may respect and who know how to do that fight. They're those of us who may be in the street. And the same goes with how we choose to define our own realities and our own fates. And when we talk about success, we need to make sure that when we bring the stakeholders together, that that's very clear because there are small-scale entities that you may be interested in creating because it is successful, but from a, a Wall Street venture capital perspective, it is an abject failure because you're not creating the type of personal wealth for people um, that is, is expected in that realm. So that's a whole different conversation, but an excellent point. I also think you have to look at scale because something can be successful but not be large. And I think that that's why collaboration at the grassroots level, roots level is going to be so important. For instance, I'm a professor. I'm also finishing up my dissertation. And my colleague is the head of the department. And we teach 4-4 load, which is a ridiculous load for a professor. We've, we don't have, we came in thinking we were going to do article every day, every, we don't have the time. It, it, we just simply do not have the time. But what we're doing now, it has been successful. So I think if you're somebody who, I mean, you have to determine what success is for you. If it's, I'm going to do two or three projects a year, that's great. But that's why I think aggregation is important. So you can take that project and spread it uh, and distribute it throughout the nation. So we've had to change our goals because we simply do not have the time. We're not getting paid. We're, we're broke. We have no money. And it, another issue is that when you, we're nonprofit. First year of a nonprofit, it is almost impossible to get funding because you have to have books for a certain amount of time. So we haven't been able to even qualify for a lot of grants. That said, we have made progress. So I think that you have to really look at the scale of what you're doing. Um, hi, what I had, what I originally was a question is kind of turned in, into a comment because of the last few questions. But um, my name's Quan Booth, I'm the co-founder of Oakland Local with Susan. Um, and I have a little bit of insight into the actual alternative business models and there are a lot of kind of hard details that I think we should probably all consider. Um, the old revenue models for media that happened, that evolved around advertising, corporate loss leaders, kind of a bigger company supporting the media, those really don't exist or are, aren't really relevant for locally, local community media like ours, because partially because of the lack of pr the perspectives and partially because a lot of our communities don't have the revenue to support these independent media. Um, Oakland Local, it's about 10 rotating people. We have two part-time staff, three third-time staff, and the rest are freelancers. Susan and I both do it for no money. We make our money through consulting. Um, the foundation money that's available for new media startups, these creative enterprises that sometimes focus on diverse communities, most of those, they, the money runs out after a year or two, and it's fierce competition for those. So if anybody's thinking about foundation money, it's a, it's a possibility, but it's a really, 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 really narrow possibility. Um, advertising as a way to fund diverse populations, like I say, it doesn't really work because a lot of our communities, are, and we focus on marginalizing people of color communities in the Oakland, California area, they don't have the money to support you the way that um, larger capital businesses would. If you look at the community funding models of places like kickstarter.com, Spot Us, um, Razu, most of our communities, again, they don't have that extra money. So one of the things that me and other hyper-local new media sites around the country are dealing with is specifically what are those new business models that we're talking about. And the question at first was asking you that, but from the conversation, I'm getting the impression that none of us really know. So, <laughs> and it's perfectly okay, except for us that try to pay the bills doing this. So something to consider is we're at the point now where ads aren't gonna pay the bills. Foundations aren't gonna pay the bills for more than one or two lucky people for one or two lucky years. 
um, community supported models. Our communities really don't have the, the money. That's part of the reason why we're doing the meeting to actually empower them to, for financial independence. So we need to actually think of some other revenue model. Maybe it's in Chris's book, and I promise he didn't pay me to say that. But <laughs> <laughs> we do have to take some really hard look at our finances. And maybe like, I'm sorry, what your name up here was saying, maybe we really need to look at how we spend our money and what our values are, because we, we do have some money. Um, there's food, there's whatever our extra money goes to, maybe we need to start thinking about how to put that to media. And if that's the case, we have to ask ourselves as media, what will our communities really fund? Like, will they fund a bunch of entertainment stories? Will they fund stories that focus on us and the way we're living in West Oakland and East Oakland and um, Los Angeles dealing with the poverty issues? Or what will our communities support? Because right now they're not doing it and the foundations aren't doing it either. So it's, again, that's more of a comment than a question, but I would love if anybody wanted to respond. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for that. And I also, I think on, on behalf of the panel, we should thank uh, Janine, because yeah. she did great. I'm sorry, we didn't clap for a while she was leaving, but I, I, aren't great moderators just amazing and far too rare? Um, is there another question right here? Um, so, and I, I'm gonna preface my comment question with um, respect to the, the folks putting this on and, and all of us who are in attendance. Um, but I'm just really gonna state the obvious that this is a largely a white conference and it's put on by an organization that is largely white. And I just had a, I've, my work has recently gone into media so this is my first conference and I was doing a lot of research on the free press and everything and I was a little surprised how long I had to scroll down on the staff list to start seeing some, um, some people of color. And I'm curious uh, for you all what thinking about these questions of diversity within the context of uh, reform conversation that itself, I think, has challenges with looking at diversity. So I just want to hear your thoughts around that. Reform broadly. This, like this, yeah, like this reform conversation that we're having here, um, yeah, just knowing that there's also challenges existing in that conversation where we're still struggling to see some diversity at this conference and that this conversation is, you know, one panel versus, you know, an integrated. Right, right. Um, wow. Um, you just kind of defined my last 10 years on panels. Um, <laughs> um, that's a really good point. And as a strong ally of free press, I have very candid conversations with, with all of my allies um, on those issues. Um, and it's important we have to, all of us, our stakeholders in the success of organizations that promote media reform and media justice. And in order to make them a better advocate, they need to hear from us on multiple axes. So what you're saying needs to be said repeatedly. Invariably, these types of conversations, when we talk about diversity from a very broad perspective, not just ethnic, because most people, when they think diversity, it's like, okay, what are black folk gonna say now, right? I mean, that's kind of like the frame for diversity. It's always, black too, you know, we, it's not the spectrum oftentimes. But when we talk about this type of diversity, it's much broader, it's, it's philosophical, it's structural, it's all of those things. Those to me seem to be the type of conversations we need to have conference wide, right? Um, but it requires us to keep making that point, right? Where we have other people validating the points we make because uh, perhaps they needed to hear not just from the usual suspects, because I always say this, I've been saying this for as long as I've been part of this circuit, but maybe they need to hear from other people too. And the example I give, I went to um, a media, progressive media um, conference in um, Denver, and there was about 300 people there, and I was the only black person there. This is all progressives. And uh, it was the closing plenary and the organizer was up there saying, and there was a PowerPoint of you know the beautiful uh, range of people and in our country of ba all different backgrounds. It was be beautiful, you know. It's a kumbaya moment. It was wonderful, right? But the audience was all white, except for me, pretty much. And I said, wouldn't it be great if a conference like this looked like that? And man, it was silent. And I just walked out. I mean, it was silent. That's all I said. And a young woman who was white, she looked like college age, she came up to me, she goes, thank you so much for saying that. I didn't even notice. And I said, that's cool, I appreciate that. The next time you're in a situation where there are no people of color to say that, that's your job. 
And the next time I'm on a panel with all men, it's my job to either take myself out of commission and put somebody up who I respect, or I say it like, what's up with this panel, right? We all have that role and we, we can do that, but structurally, your issues, it, it reaches a, a far deeper thing that is not gonna be resolved in one conference on one day or one panel, but I will say this, um, if we ourselves don't reflect the values we believe in most, um, we lose. We lose. Um, and eventually, people are going to learn the right way or they're going to learn the hard way. And uh, one of the things I learned is don't sell soap to people who don't wash. <laughs> so some people will never get it. And the good news is they will suffer for it. I believe that Free Press has the capacity and collective will to get it right. But sometimes we all need to be kicked in the ass. I'm one of those people, too. We all have sites of privilege. Some we acknowledge, some we don't. And sometimes we forget about it because we're fighting the good fight. Free press is on the front lines when it comes to this stuff, but that doesn't mean they're gonna be perfect on all axes. Somebody has to call me out when I'm sexist or classist or something like that, and I don't like to hear it, but it's, if it's coming from a place of love, then I prosper. So I think that's what we have to continue to do, and you have to continue raising those points. Um, so I have a different take on that. I'm Linda Jew, and I am the director of the G.W. Williams Center for Independent Journalism, and I am working on that very issue. Um, in fact, we had um, a meeting last night <clears throat> between journalists and advocates on, on particularly um, why it's difficult for ethnic and immigrant journalists representing that media to cover media policy issues. And I think that uh, in addition to what Chris has said, which I think, you know, we all know. There's also another issue of our being able to get the news out to our communities about media policy and media reform issues through our respective media. And um, it's very difficult for community and ethnic and immigrant media to cover policy issues when they're, under, they're even more under-resourced than most other media. And the reporters are wearing different hats and you have language and cultural barriers and other kinds of barriers to deal with this particular problem and to get them to understand that this actually affects their lives on a daily basis. And um, the GW Williams Center sponsored along with the uh, New York Community Media Alliance, which is a consortium of ethnic media in New York. We sponsored each a pilot uh, reporting fellowship for ethnic media journalists to report on these issues. And, the pilot taught us a lot of lessons on how difficult it is to get this information out to people because people don't understand it, the policy issues enough to, to talk about it to other people. To, reporters don't understand it enough. So I think there's also, a, in addition to the, the, what Chris said, there's a, there's a responsibility for those of us that do work in our own media within our communities that we have to turn this into a beat that we follow and be as committed to this issue and covering it for our communities so that they can be brought up to speed, and when they see an announcement about the Media Reform Conference, they're gonna understand what this conference is about and then want to attend it. And in which case, if there's a, a critical mass of people who wanna come who can't afford, we can raise money to bring them. But right now, there's not a critical mass of interest in this issue among communities of color, and that is a fact. And we need to acknowledge that. I agree with you, and I think that this is an issue and it's not discussed enough, and this is what I'm gonna say coming from an education perspective. People who tend to be at the top of media policy organizations are individuals who have PhDs or law degrees. Unfortunately, there are not enough people of color specifically interested in, in issues of media policy that are getting these type of degrees. I can say for myself in terms of I'm getting my degree from University of Illinois. That's how I got linked up with uh, Dr. McChesney. In terms of people who were of color interested in media policy, you're looking at him. So, and I think that that is the issue because, and this is not fair, but in terms of expertise, we look at who is the Esquire or who has the PhD and say Are you, that you can speak on this issue of media policy. Now we see Malkia, who is just as qualified as anybody, but how many people get to that level or are allowed to get to that level? 
So it's either changing who we see as an expert, which was an earlier discussion, or, and we probably need to do both, we need to find more people of color and fill, get more people of color into graduate schools. Um, because that is a crisis. Um, less than one half of 1% of people of color get a PhD. Less than one half of 1% of people of color get a PhD. So when you talk about policy and you're emphasizing PhDs, that's why the organization looks the way that it does, in part. Now, we need to change that, but how, that's a discussion we need to have. Does anyone have a last word or that? It's about wrap up time. Oh, well, I don't know that this is the last word, but uh, unlike Chris, I'm going to give you a book if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, the Latino Public Radio Station's directory. Please look at it and see if there's a station near you that you can uh, collaborate with. All right. Um, yeah, I, I guess we are out of, officially out of time, but uh, I guess some of us will stick around for as long as there's interest afterwards. So give yourselves a round of applause. And thank you.